Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Dynamic Life. Thank you for those who have taken the time to come out and be here physically and personally. We pray that uh, the Lord will bless you this evening, that you will hear from the Lord from His Word. Uh, through His Word, we thank you for those who are tuning in uh, by Facebook Live. We appreciate uh, taking the time to gather around your various devices uh, to join us in Bible study tonight. We're continuing our subject. The issue is enmity and not ethnicity in the church among Christians. And so we're beginning still talking about that subject because I think it is vitally important in the day and age that we live in to uh, help believers and help churches and help pastors and schools to come to an understanding of how we who profess to be followers of Christ should look at the ethnic uh, and cultural issues that permeate not only our culture, but even permeate our churches and our Christian homes and Christian schools and Christian world and Christian life. And so uh, we've been talking about some of the um, aspects and some of the world views, if you will, that hinder uh, unity and diversity in the church and among believers. And we talked about the impact of Darwinism on, on this subject of ethnic issues and how Darwinism taught the evolution of man and some have evolved further and faster, and some didn't evolve further and faster at all, uh, which is a false teaching and a false theory that we as believers should not be giving any uh, acknowledgement to or any validity to. Uh, the second issue was the impact of cultural fears on ethnic issues. We talked about various cultural fears. Uh, there are fears of the uh, majority and the minority, and the fear of the minority and the majority. There are fears of uh, uh, that come about because of false ideologies and world philosophy that have been taught or believed and stereotypes and prejudice and bigotry and biases and, and all those things that have led people to fear uh, one another rather than to see how common we are in Christ and how we are in common need of the salvation of Christ that can only be found through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, through the cross and through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The third worldview I would like to do with tonight is the misapplication of Scripture, the misapplication or interpretation of Scripture. So Darwinism, cultural fears, and tonight uh, the impact of scriptural misinterpretation or misapplication of Scripture. One of the things we need to realize, if you interpret the Scripture wrongly, your chances of misapplying them are 100%. Mm -hmm. If you misinterpret the scriptures wrongly, the percentage of you misapplying them is, is very likely 100%. Mm -hmm. And there have been, uh, down through time and down through history, especially in American history, but not just American history, we could travel all around the world and find uh, people being mistreated, people being seen as less than or better than or inferior to or not superior uh, because really at its root it's a sin issue. At its root it's a sin issue. Let me say it one more time. At its root it's a sin issue. It is not first a cultural issue. It is not first a psychological issue. It is not first any other issue than a sin issue. It is Satan's desire to keep humanity divided. And not only humanity, Satan wants to cause division and disunity and discord in the church. Because he knows the Bible well. That God works in the midst of unity. That Jesus has died and was resurrected and has ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father to preserve the unity that he desired to bring about by his death, birth, and resurrection. And that he prayed for in John chapter 17 as we saw last time. So any philosophy, any worldview, any ideology, any thought process, any attitude, any action or activity contrary to what God says is sin. Amen. And until we start calling it sin, then we will keep dealing with the symptoms and never get to the root cause. Now, this issue of diversity and unity, this issue of division based on ethnic makeup or cultural background or because of uh, your status in life or lack of status in life, 
will never go away until Jesus comes to rule. But the one place that people ought to be able to see the model of unity and diversity is the church. Because that's where Christ is already supposed to be ruling. He's going to come and rule the nations. He's going to come and rule the world. But he rules as head of the church right now. So right now, his body, which is the church, are to reflect the dictates and mindset and behavior of the head. And the head, who is Christ, is not a racist. The head, who is Christ, does not think other people are better than other people. Christ loves all his children equally. From whatever class, whatever culture, whatever color they come from, he loves them all. And he welcomes all to come into the kingdom Amen. by faith in him alone. There is no one he's shutting out. And so if Christ is not shutting people out, if Christ is not segregating the church, then we have no right to do what the head is not doing and call ourselves believers. By the way, I don't know if you knew this, that the real term for us is not Christian. The real term for us that is used over a thousand times in the Bible is believers. Mm -hmm. We are believers. And if we believe in the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if we believe in the same need to receive him for the forgiveness of our sin, then we have everything in common that we need to have in common. So there's no reason that you can justify or any group can justify or any denomination can justify or any fill in your blank can justify keeping us segregated when Christ died and is ruling at the right hand of the Father to keep us unified. And when he has sent the Holy Spirit to maintain that unity. To do that is to grieve the Spirit. To do that is sin. 24-7, seven days a week, 12 months a year, 365 days a year. I don't care what time period it is. It was a sin in the first century. It was a sin in the Old Testament. It's a sin today. But the model that he has set, the picture or illustration of this unity, the church, has been far too long messing up the illustration. Now, there are a number of reasons for that, and I won't go into all that. Some of it is some of the things we already talked about, Darwinism, infecting the church and affecting our school system and affecting our homes, uh, cultural fears. If we all have the same advantages, if we all have a level playing field, then I might not excel and they might excel, therefore I won't have the position and the things that I want to have and I won't be in control and I won't be in power. All of that sinful behavior. Yeah. All of that is a result of human pride. God died to save humanity. And humanity comes in all kinds of shades. Some lighter, some darker, some somewhere in between. And so therefore, the church, in my understanding of study of scripture, is the problem, not the world. Because the church is the one that God chose, that Christ died for, that Christ is building to reflect his mindset in the world, how he sees things in the world. So therefore, when we don't live it, there is no plan B. Hmm. You can't expect people who are dead in sins and trespasses, according to Ephesians chapter 2, who live for themselves and not for God, who are selfish by nature, naughty by nature, dead in sins and trespasses by nature, to love other people more than they love themselves. Right. Now, I don't know how much you know about what's going on in our culture today, but socialism is the big buzzword, and socialism is, is, is not a biblical concept. Basically, socialism says you take from those who have to give to those who don't have so that everybody can be equal. That's not even a biblical concept. 
You don't take from others to give to others so that everybody can have the same. That doesn't even happen in heaven. And it doesn't even happen in hell. If you know your Bibles and read your Bibles, you know that everybody will not receive the same amount of rewards in heaven when we get to heaven. So socialism isn't in heaven. God is not going to take from those who were obedient and give to those who were disobedient so everybody be equal. <laughs> the Bible says some of us will suffer loss because we didn't live in obedience while our feet were walking on earth. But everybody's not equally punished, equally in hell either. There are some who will be more punished or have greater condemnation or greatest punishment in hell than others will. So even hell's not a socialist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are y'all with me this evening? Amen. Yes. Satan's not going to take punishment from you because he feels bad for you and give it to people who have less punishment so everybody has punishment equally. It's not going to happen. There's a lot of isms going on in the 21st century, though. Isms will kill you. <laughs> yes, they will. We did a lesson on isms. You did. A couple of months ago. That's funny. And so um, the Bible, the Bible is clear in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. If you haven't turned there, let's turn there. Ephesians chapter 2, which is the foundation for what I'm teaching. And there's so many scriptures I can give you because this subject is all over the Bible all over the Bible, but it is missed by most commentaries. It is missed by most pastors because it's not taught as an emphasis of Christ's work in salvation or the outworking of Christ's work in salvation. And just to refresh ourselves, we're going to start with verse 11 of chapter 2 of Ephesians. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh. A Gentile was anybody who was not a Jew. And Gentiles were considered pagans because they worshiped pagan gods, and they are part of cults, and they were not followers of the God of Israel, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. So the uncircumcision would be the Gentiles, and the circumcision would be the Jews. Okay? And they were two distinct people groups. See, some of y'all didn't catch that. <laughs> they were two distinct people groups. Amen. Let me get to that one more time. They were two distinct people groups. Amen. So in God's economy, how many people groups were there? Two. But we didn't divide this thing all up. We can't even recognize it. You were either a Jew or you were a Gentile. You were either redeemed or you were unredeemed. You were either saved or unsaved. You were either dead in sins and trespasses or you have been made alive in Christ. Sounds like two is very common too in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> You're either light or you dark. You are the sons of the day or you are sons of the night. Sounds like two is very common. Mm -hmm. So where are we getting all this variety? Isms. Isms, my sister said. <laughs> Verse 12, that at that time you were out Christ, meaning the Gentiles, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, the promises of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. So Gentiles, any Jews in the room? So I mean, everybody here is a Gentile. Mm -hmm. So this was about you before you were saved. Amen. Amen. You were outside the promises of God. Mm -hmm. You were outside the inheritance rights of God. You were outside the covenants of God. You were separated from God. <clears throat> but God did something in Christ Jesus. Thank Hallelujah. Lord. Having no hope. Now, it says you had no hope. Mm -hmm. You were on your way to bust hell wide open. No hope of rescue. Mm -hmm. Until no. God did something. But the Jews were too. They, they just had the benefit of being Jews and having the Moses as their leader and, and having the Messiah come through their line. But they were un, just as lost as everybody else, which is what Romans 9, 10, and 11 teaches. But the point here is that in that culture, in that world, Gentiles were seen as those who were separated from God because they were not, what, following the God of Israel, who is Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the God of creation. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, 
you who were far off, having been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's praise the Lord time right there. <laughs> Amen. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's a reference to his sacrificial death on the cross. We have been brought near. We who were far off, Gentiles, the uncircumcised, have been brought near as a result of the death of Christ, the shedding of his blood. Because then that we have what? The remission or forgiveness of our sins. And every Jew needed that too. Amen. Having Jewish privilege would not have saved them. Even though they were descendants of Abraham, even though they had the covenant, even though they had the Torah and the law, even though they were the people to the elect nation of Israel, that does not save anybody. And that's the whole point of the book of Hebrews, is trying to get Jews to understand, leave that and come to Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ is superior to Moses. Christ is superior to the law. Christ is superior to the dietary restrictions. Christ is superior to the ceremonial restrictions and practices. Leave that, come to Christ. <clears throat> But Paul is writing about the church, which was a mystery in the Old Testament. And a mystery is something that had not been revealed up until this point. Okay? Verse 14, for he himself, that's emphatic in the Greek, he and nobody else but he, he himself is our peace, who has made both what? Yeah. <clears throat> peace to both. Who's the both? So either you were a Jew or a Gentile, right? Amen. So that includes all these divisive groups we got going on today, right? Because you're either under the category of Jew or you're under the category of Gentile, but he has made the two into one. one. See, God's in the map, lowest common denominator. Racial divide. <laughs> all right? And has broken down the middle wall of separation, if you don't know what that is. In the Old Testament, when the Jews came to worship, and there were Gentiles who, who made their allegiance to the nation of Israel, making allegiance to their God. There was a wall that separated the, the, the court of the Gentiles from the area of the Jews. So they were segregated. But when Christ died, he tore down the middle wall partition. They're no longer segregated. So therefore, why, how are we going to rebuild walls that Christ died to tear down? How are you going to have one group sitting on the floor of your church and the other group up in the balcony like there's a wall between them. Mm -hmm. As my sister said, isms. <laughs> Sinism. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he broke down the separation and it's a reflection on the old temple where they used to meet for worship, where they used to come and meet with God. There was a wall that separated, a curtain that separated but Jesus tore that curtain in half and in two by his death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. And the two are now become one. one. Do, 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 are you getting this? Yes. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. Now, there could be a lot of people under the Gentile category, a lot of ethnic groups under the Gentile category, but you, you fit in that category. Yeah. And we're no longer separated. We're now one in the church. See, Ephesians is about the church. It's not about the world. They're not one out in the world. They're one in the body of Christ, the church. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, there it is. The issue is enmity, not ethnicity. Ethnicity was not an issue in the first century. Sorry to bust your bubble. The problem was the enemy, what? Enmity, the hostility between the two groups. And not only the hostility between the two groups, there was a hostility between God and man. Christ's death solved both. Amen. Romans chapter 5 says we were enemies of God. There was a hostility. People hated God. They were indifferent to God. They didn't acknowledge the God of the Bible as the God of their lives. 
And even if you don't think you're God's enemy, he's your enemy. Mm -hmm. If you're unsaved. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you guys know, I meet people say, well, me and God cool. No, you're not cool. <laughs> And if you're cool with God, he ain't cool with you. <laughs> no, you're his enemy. And he's your enemy. No, no, I, I like the big guy upstairs. Well, first of all, ain't no big guy upstairs. There's Yahweh. There's God. There's the creator God, the judge God, the self-sustaining God, the eternal God. It's not a big guy upstairs. Well, my, my buddy has said, no, he's not your buddy. Wrong house. He's not your ace boom coon. He's not your partner. <laughs> he's God. Amen. See, we have lost respect for the holiness yeah. and the righteousness and the character of God. Amen. To where we've made him very common. Amen. And we refer to him in ways that are really disrespectful. But we see that in our culture among human beings, don't we? Yeah. Men running around who are married talking about my old lady. Oh, yeah, that's, that's awful. Oh. That's your wife. That's awful. I agree. That is just... And we treat oh, things very common. Mm -hmm. And nothing has respect anymore. Mm -hmm. That's true. There's no reverence for anything any longer. Mm -hmm. There's no holy fear that you might blaspheme the character and the name of God. Having I mean, by the end that the law of commandments contained in the orders so as to create himself one new man. Do we get the point? One, one, one. The two have become one. And just like in a marriage where God is joined together, let no man put a thunder because the two become So we need to stop divorcing each other over shades, hmm. status, shades, 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 colors, oh. ethnic makeup. <laughs> it's really just a different shade. It's, like, okay. it's not even a color. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There are no white people. Mm -mm. We're close there are people who have less melanin, but they're not white. That table is closer to white than you are. Yeah. Goodness. <laughs> there ain't no black people. We're ivory. <laughs> there are people who have a darker shade, but they ain't black. Mm -hmm. The legs on that chair is black. You don't see a whole lot of people looking like that, do you? No. So it's really an issue of science. It's an issue of creation. Some have more melanin than the other. That's what makes them darker. And some have less. That's what makes you a lighter shade. And we're divided over shade. And we put all kinds of stereotypes on shades, which is not of God. So he makes one from the two, making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God. Reconcile how many to God? Both. The two have become one. He reconciles to God. So since we are reconciled with God, and you're reconciled with God, I have no right to divide what God has reconciled. Mm -hmm. What God has mended, what God has brought together. Amen. In one body, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. He put to death the hostility, the separation. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, meaning Gentiles, and to those who were near, meaning Jews, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Mm -hmm. We got so much more in common than we got different. Amen. As Christians. Yeah. As believers. But the church has been messing this up. Mm -hmm. Because it has taken cultural worldviews and dismissed the word of God. And then we've done that with Darwinism. We've done that with cultural fears. But tonight I want to talk about the impact of scriptural misinterpretation and misapplication related to this issue. The misinterpretation and misapplication of scripture by the church 
has contributed to the ethnic and cultural division among various people groups in America and around the world. Racism in the American cult church, whether as a result of Darwinism or human wisdom or cultural fears, continues with the misinterpretation and misapplication of God's word. These factors encourage ethnic and cultural division rather than biblical harmony and unity, while hindering illustration of biblical solutions for ethnic and cultural division and discord. The root of racial discord and division is in the central heart of mankind and life in a fallen world. In other words, the world will never know what it is to be unified. But in the body of Christ, Christ has done the work to unify us. And jump over with me to chapter 4 of Ephesians, if you will. <clears throat> I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. So he's now talking what? Both Jews and Gentiles, right? Saved Jews and Gentiles. Redeemed. Right? Mm -hmm. Believers. Not churchgoers. He ain't talking to Baptists. He ain't talking to Presbyterians. He ain't talking to men. He's talking to believers. Those who have been reconciled to Christ and therefore have been reconciled to one another. What word of the calling which you are called? That word calling is always the call to election or salvation. So we now have to work, walk out our salvation. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Christ has already brought the unity. We must endeavor to what? Keep the unity he died to bring about. Amen. So we're not trying to get unified. We're trying to what? Live out the unity that Christ already died to bring about. Amen. And that's one of the ways we what? Walk out our calling. That we live out our salvation. The problem is we got too many people claiming to be saved who are not saved. And that's enough the illustration. <laughs> oh, we got labels. Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Charismatic. That, that, that don't make you say. You, you heard me say a couple of Sundays ago, you can walk at McDonald's and say, say you're, you're, you're a Big Mac. Anybody with any intelligence will look at you and say, that ain't too all beef packs, special off love cheese and pickles with a sexy bun. Anybody with any sense will realize, these are the ingredients. This is the evidence of what a Big Mac is. You calling yourself a Big Mac don't make you a Big Mac. It makes you insane. <laughs> and there's a lot of insanity going on in God's house where people are supposed to have their minds set right. When we continue to accentuate the divide, that Christ died to bridge, that is insane. That is not the mind of Christ. That is not the picture of the church. That is not the reality of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and the outworking of the death, burial, and resurrection. But so many people are controlled by the worldview and not a biblical view when it comes to this issue. And, and the church, now listen to me now, the church the man-manufactured version of church. Not the church that God brought in existence. The man-made church keeps messing up the illustration. Mm -hmm. I want to be succinct with that. I want, I want you to understand there's a difference between the church that Christ oversees mm -hmm. and the church that man makes. Mm -hmm. Racism, bigotry, Prejudice, stereotypes that are not biblical are not allowed in God's church. Mm -hmm. But it is allowed in the man manufactured version of church. Mm -hmm. And if man manufactured it, the devil oversaw the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So it's really the devil's church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all the churches is a call out of sin. And Satan calls out people in the world to counterfeit so he can mess folk up. 
He wants to mar the illustration. He wants to rewrite the Bible. He wants to manufacture followers after him. Because remember, one of the reasons he got kicked out of heaven was he wanted to be like God. He still wants to be like God. And he wants to have worshipers just like God wants to have worshipers. But his illustration doesn't look like God's illustration. You have to understand that. And there have been churches, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, you fill in the blank, who have taken scripture to justify maintain, maintaining the division and discord. And it's not biblical and it's sinful to do that. Y'all with me still? Amen. These factors encourage ethnic and cultural division rather than biblical harmony and unity while hindering illustration. The root of racial discord and division is the sinful heart of mankind like in a fallen world. No earthly wisdom can fix the problem of a sinful heart. So y'all can march y'all blue in the face. Y'all can vote in whoever y'all want to vote in. Y'all can go down there and, and riot and do whatever, storm the Capitol, storm the police station, burn, whatever you want to burn. That will not fix a sinful human heart. Only the gospel, only the good news of Jesus Christ can fix a sinful heart. Amen. And a sinful heart is the problem. Amen. Not slavery from the 1600s. Not the fact that Jim Crow laws were enacted. All that's bad. But the problem is sinful hearts. Amen. And one of the problems is we want to change structure without changing people. But people run the structures. People run the government. People run the business. People run this. People run that. And if their heart is messed up, whatever they're running is going to probably be messed up. Oh, yeah. The church is the solution to the problem. Amen. But what happens when the solution to the problem gets messed up? Yeah. Where is the other solution? <laughs> if there's only one solution, and that solution is not saluting, my word, I made it up, it's not a condition. <laughs> if that solution is not living out what it was meant to live out, where else do you go to fix the problem? And this is why we have not been able to fix the racial and ethnic discord for 400 years in America. Because the solution has been messed up. But that's what happens when the enemy infiltrates God's house. And we allow the enemy to take over God's house. The church must model heavenly wisdom from above in order to heal the division and discord. The seed of the power and the truth of the gospel planted in the heart of sinful people is the only solution for producing a tree that will bear fruit of racial unity and diversity. You got to change people's hearts. And if you change their heart, you change their lives. And if you change their heart and their lives, you change how they act and what they do and how they treat other people. You don't change it by changing people in the White House. <laughs> or the black house or the Asian house or the senate or the house of representatives mm -hmm. they make laws based on their sinful desires while there's a place for social institutions government policies they all have a place civil movements they all have a place and judicial laws to address the symptoms only the gospel of Jesus Christ can address the root of racial disharmony and division. Those other things can address the symptom, they cannot address the root. Mm -hmm. Only the gospel, mm -hmm. only the church, only believers of Jesus Christ, learners and followers of Jesus Christ can do that. Mm -hmm. But the question now stands before us, what are some of the misinterpretations and misapplications being used by the church who is trying to be like the culture to justify and support racial superiority and inferiority. One is in Genesis chapter 9. Turn to Genesis chapter 9 if you will. Genesis chapter 9, story that we should all be familiar with. Noah and his sons 
Remember, God brought a, brought a great flood and wiped out all of creation except for eight people. Everybody familiar with that story? Yes, sir. If you're not, go back and read 6, 7, 8, and 9 in Genesis and you'll get familiar with the story. But God brought a flood because he was grieved that he had made man. Sin was running so rampant over the earth at that time that God was grieved that he had ever made, ever made man. And he could only find one righteous person on all the earth. That ain't hit y'all like it was supposed to hit you. <laughs> Out of all the earth, God said, I can only find one righteous man. No. No. No, <laughs> no come back. One. One. The same problem happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, did it not? Amen. He couldn't even find 10 righteous folk mm -hmm. in a whole city of probably a population of 250,000 people. Couldn't find 10 righteous folk. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you there's a lot of people going to church. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't find 10 righteous people or God would have saved the city. Mm -hmm. In this context, he can only find one righteous man. Mm -hmm. Now, here, here's the wonderful grace of God. For 120 years, Noah was building that boat, that ark. People saw it. They mocked him. They made fun of him. They did not believe what he was saying. And, and it was a simple sermon. I know you guys all like for me to preach like this, but it ain't going to happen, so don't even try to say it. <laughs> but the sermon was very simple. God said, it's going to rain. Get on the boat. That was the sermon. Now, it had never rained on the earth up until this time. So people didn't even know what rain was. And for 120 years, God was patient with mankind. As sinful as they was, they were, for 120 years, God was giving them an opportunity to repent. Mm -hmm. And then on day 119, At the stroke of midnight, when it turned over to 120, people began to feel drops of water coming from the sky. Now, I'm not the most brilliant person, but I just happened to think, if I had seen all those animals lining up two by two, <laughs> getting on that boat, I might have thought something was going on. <laughs> and even if I had some they doubt, I think I just would have got on the boat just to be. I would like to think I would have done that. I like my instincts. I might want to follow them. <laughs> but I don't think I would because God said, even if He had been there, I only found one righteous man. Mm -hmm. Maybe He would have built an ark. <laughs> I ain't building nothing. God's surely going to have to talk to me to build anything. Because you don't want me hammering no nails. You don't want me having a screwdriver. You don't want me no power tools. You don't want me with none of that. Okay. Fair enough. Very good, very good. So they get on the boat, and it rains for 40 days and 40 nights, right? Mm -hmm. And water covers the earth, and everything dies. Everything dies. Everything's killed by the flood. There's water everywhere. And then the water resides, and, and the boat lands, the ark lands. And they get out, and that's where we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 9. Look at verse 18 of Genesis chapter 9. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So there were eight people on the boat, and they were all Noah's family. Mm -hmm. Come on, eight people. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Some of y'all getting left behind. Mm -hmm. Three of you. Mm -hmm. That ought to make you shiver in your boots just a little bit. Mm -hmm. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jacob. Their names reflect their shape. Their, let me use a phrase that you're familiar with. Their skin tone. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Ham was dark. That's what Ham, the word Ham means. Japheth was somewhere in between, and Shem was light. So the ethnicities are built into Noah's three sons. And they repopulate the whole world. Now I can give you the science of how that can happen. There's a good book by Ken Davis 
and Charles Ware called uh, One Blood that tells, gives you all the signs of how that can happen and how you can repopulate and have all the different ethnic groups just out of three people. But we don't have time to deal with that tonight. And Ham, verse, in the next part of the verse says, and Ham was the father of who? Canaan. Everybody got that? So Canaan is the son of Ham, right? These three were the sons of Noah, and from these, the whole earth was populated. See, I didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. From these three, the whole world was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and plant, he planted a vineyard, Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in a tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, everybody got that? saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be... <laughs> who got cursed? Canaan. Who was Canaan? Son of, son. Son of who? Canaan. A servant of servants, he shall be to his brother. Now, what happened is that back in time, there was a Bible written where in the notes on this text, it says that Ham was cursed. We call it the curse of Ham. But you all just read the text. It wasn't Ham who was cursed. It was who? Ham. Who was one of the sons of Ham. Not all the sons of Ham. And that, that was taught in seminaries and Bible college that all dark-skinned people were meant to be slaves of the other two brothers. Mm. <laughs> so it was taught that all blacks, all dark-skinned people, were meant to be slaves of Shem and Japheth's kinfolk. So therefore, why, the reason why blacks should be slaves, Africans should be slaves, is because of the curse of Ham. But Ham wasn't cursed, it was Canaan. Mm -hmm. But it was taught in seminaries that the curse was on Ham, which means all his descendants would have been cursed to be slaves. And that's how the church misapplied scripture to line up with the culture. Same way y'all get stuff in that ain't in the Bible. <laughs> you want to justify and rationalize. See, when you don't want to suffer, yeah. see, they wanted to capitulate with the culture. Because of white privilege and white dominance, they had to come with a Bible scripture to justify what the culture was justifying. Mm -hmm. okay. So that they wouldn't be what? Attacked by the culture. Come on, think about this. Think about this. You got to think through this. If you are a part of the majority group, whites, and you don't want to suffer retribution from other whites, you got to figure out to go away to go along with them so that they don't come against you. Well, it's not really my personality, but we'll go with that. You but that, go, you go with that's what happened in the culture. Against the grain. You in go the against culture. the grain and you're going to get roughed up. That's what happened in the culture. <laughs> Fair enough. See, I, I don't want to support the fact that you're wrong as a majority group when I belong to a majority group and then have you come and burn my business. <laughs> Fair enough. Or have you come, come and persecute me. So what they decided to do is go to the scriptures, misapply the scriptures, <clears throat> so they could justify lining up with the culture. Mm -hmm. It goes against everything what the Bible says. We don't care what the Bible Every says until we care what the Bible says. <laughs> I'm just telling you what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was in the footnotes of, of the old Schofield Bible. Mm -hmm. And this was taught in seminaries and Bible colleges, and people and pastors were getting trained in Bible college and seminary and going out and teaching this in their churches. Mm -hmm. And because the pastor was saying it, the people were saying it must be right. Mm -hmm. But if you just read the text, You can't come up with that. Right. But people didn't care about the text. Mm -hmm. 
we got another thing that's going on in our modern day, right? They want to tear down all the statues of people who own slaves. Yeah. Take their names off schools, take their names off colleges, take their names off this, take their names off that. Because if you own a slave, that was sin. You don't get that from the Bible. Mm -mm. You don't get that from the Bible. Owning slaves in the Bible was not a sin. It happened in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Leviticus chapter 25, Genesis. The people of Israel owned slaves. Mm -hmm. Some of them were their own people, and some of them were foreigners. Because there was a number of ways to become a slave, and this even happened in the first century. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching a, a New Testament survey class on Tuesday nights at a seminary online, and, and there was a section where they had to read about this, where slaves were all over the then world at that time in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It's messing folk up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because there's no condemnation for people being slaves, and there come no condemnation for people having slaves. So let me tell you what the danger is that people don't even know. If you're going to burn up everything and tear down all the statues because people own slaves, you got to burn this Bible. Because people own slaves in the Bible. Do you see the danger? If you're going to take their name off the schools and the buildings and this and that, you got to take God's name off the Bible. Mm -hmm. We live in dangerous times. Mm -hmm. It's a misapplication of scripture. It's not wrong to own slaves. The Bible doesn't tell you not to own slaves. It tells you how to treat them. Amen. It tells you how long they should be slaves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't tell you it's a sin to have slaves. Mm -hmm. Well, Philemon says you treat him like a brother. Right. Which would be an employee. You treat him like a brother. No, no, no. no. You treat him yeah. equally, equally, and you treat him with respect right. because you're equal in Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. The slave has a master, but the master has a master too. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is what Ephesians and Colossians teaches. Right. Mm -hmm. In other words, treat your slave master like you want your master to treat you because he's your master, that means you're his slave. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's the Bible. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's the golden rule. But there's nothing in the Bible that condemns slavery. I'm sorry. That'll get me stoned in most places. I do not care. Because it's about truth. It's about truth. The Ten Commandments mention slavery twice, showing God's implicit acceptance of it, Exodus 20, 10, and 17. God does not condemn the idea of slavery. Jesus didn't condemn the idea of slavery. Paul didn't condemn the idea of slavery. It does tell you how you are to treat your slaves, especially if they are a brother or a sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. So I will not misapply script, misapply scripture just to line up with my race mm -hmm. or my ethnic group. It's about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. But what you need to know in the Bible, it wasn't just black folks who were slaves. Mm -hmm. There were European folk that were slaves too. Mm -hmm. Egyptians who were slaves. Mm -hmm. Assyrians who were slaves. Babylonians who were slaves. In the black. Mm -hmm. Slavery wasn't just localized to just one people group like the Curse of Ham tries to teach. Mm -hmm. Irish made slaves of their own people. Mm -hmm. The Chinese made slaves of their own people. Mm -hmm. Come close. Black folks in Africa made slaves of their own people. Mm -hmm. I can take you to the place in the world right now. Everybody black in that country. The government, the senate, the, the, the emperor, the ruler, and the mistreated people look just like them. Mm -hmm. Because it's a sin issue. Right. Amen. Not a race or ethnic issue. Mm -hmm. Did you know slaves could be doctors and lawyers? Mm -hmm. 
in the Bible. They could be soldiers. They could be politicians. One of the ways that people became slaves is that one king conquers another nation. So then when he conquers that nation, all the people of that nation now become what? Slaves in his country. And they could be doctors, they could be lawyers, they could be politicians, they could be athletes. This is in the Bible. This is in the Old Testament and New Testament time. It was not based on ethnicity. People could sell themselves into slavery. Mm -hmm. Because they were better off in slavery than they were being free. Right. Slaves were treated well because they had, depending on who their master was, because the respect of the master would trickle down to the slave. But the Bible always condemns abuse of slavery. But it does not condemn slavery. Are y'all with me? Yes. It always, always uh, condemns abuse of slavery. Amen. But it does not condemn slavery. And you need to study history for yourself instead of letting the news media people who have an agenda tell you what history is. Amen. There were slave owners who treated their slaves better than their children in American history. There were some American slave owners who kept people as slaves because they knew they were better under them than they were if they were free, because they couldn't take care of themselves. So rather than setting them free and let them starve to death or be captured and beaten, they took care of them. They taught them how to read. They gave them education. They gave them jobs. They put food on their table. But this is not what you're hearing in the news media. It's twisted for their own narrative for their own purpose. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, you can buy yourself out of slavery. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, especially as an Israelite, you could only be a slave for seven years and then you had to be let go. Mm -hmm. Unless you wanted to stay. So there is no abusiveness in God's concept of slavery. Mm -hmm. Are y'all with me? Yeah. But slavery is not a sin in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And all black folks were not the only one who were meant or destined to be slaves. That's the truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So you didn't, you didn't have your slaves in the church, sitting up in the rafters while you sat on the floor. You sat among one another. Mm -hmm. In New Testament times, the slaves and the owners worshiped together. Mm -hmm. Can I really mess you up? Your slave could have been your pastor, mm -hmm. and you was the owner mm -hmm. in the New Testament. He could have been your deacon, and you were the owner in the New Testament. Because class and status out there has nothing to do up in here in the body of Christ. And it can be reversed at church. This is the New Testament. This is the world that slavery was going on, and this is what was going on. Just read your Bible sometime. Do some background study in the New Testament. Find out about their work. You'll be surprised. Slavery was widespread throughout the Roman world, and yet Jesus never spoke against it. Did you know that? Never spoke against it? The, Paul, the apostle Paul specifically commanded slaves to obey their masters, Ephesians 6, 5, 8. But he also told masters how to treat their slaves. But he never condemned them. He never tells them, you're wrong for having slaves, let my people go. <laughs> Paul returned a runaway slave, Philemon, to his master in Philemon, verse 12. He told him to go back. Then he told the slave owner, receive him back as a brother because he has given his life to Christ.
You see what happens when we don't know our Bible? This type of pro thought process became the worldview of the church for white superiority and segregation of whites from other races. This thought process became the basis of superiority of European culture over all other cultures and cultural practices. I was at a seminary um, last year now, is that last year? In Minnesota, right where the George Floyd stuff all happened. And I was teaching this at the, at the workshops I was doing. And uh, I had a meeting with the professors of that school uh, later the next day. And uh, I asked them flat out, where in the Bible does it say the European way of doing things is the only way to do things? Why is white always right? Now, I'm sitting with professors now. You've got to understand. But that's the mentality in many institutions that call themselves Christian. If your music doesn't sound like the way Europeans do it, then your mu music is demonic or fleshly or world. Where that at in the Bible? And here's what I said, and I, I say these things lovingly, but I, I, I have no problem challenging folks. I, I don't care. I don't care at all. I'm about church. If we're really going to do the right music style, then we got to do it the way they did it in the first century. Why is it we got to do it the European way? Four bars, four courses, four lines, very mild tempo, don't get too excited. And it's got to be an organ, a pipe organ. No drums, no guitars, no. Now, there are abuses with that stuff, don't get me wrong. But to say and make it like God does not like the other way other cultures and other people groups worship him, as long as it's in spirit and truth, as long as their heart is right, you tell me he does not accept that. Your white privilege is wrong. It's about the heart. Amen. Jesus gives that in, in a story that he gives in the Gospels where you have a Pharisee and you have a, a publican. And the Pharisee looks up to heaven and says, God, I'm glad you didn't make me like him. Blah, blah, blah. I do this. I do that. And the publican wouldn't even look up to heaven. He pleaded with God about his sinfulness. His unworthiness. While the Pharisee was pleading about his worthiness based on being a Pharisee and a Jew. And Jesus said, which one of these men do you think went to their house justified? See, in that culture, they would say the Pharisee. Jesus said, no, the publican, because he was humble. He showed attrition. He showed godly sorrow for his sin. The Pharisee was prideful. Thought he had a right to be up in here talking to God. It's about the heart. It's about the heart. Whose worship do you think God is going to accept? The man who acts like the Pharisee the one who acts like the publican? Let's say the publican did it with the wrong style according to you, but Jesus says his heart was right. The Pharisee had the right style. He did the European way, but his heart was wrong. I don't receive that. So having the right style is not what matters. It's your heart. Your heart. And the church has not been teaching this. We've been allowing our status, our privilege, we've been allowing our fear of the culture and people in our own people group to manipulate us, even to manipulate the scriptures to say something that it doesn't say and support something it doesn't support. Do you see why your pastor says the church is the problem? Not the world. This thought process became the basis of superiority of European culture over all cultures and cultural practice. In response to this, African Americans adopted the same attitude and action towards whites. 
We turn around and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And other ethnic groups and cultures. The Bible does not support this type of thinking. Ken Ham and Charles Ware stated, while the Bible acknowledges and regulates slavery, there were some striking differences between race-based slavery and biblical instructions for believers. Neither the Old nor New Testament attaches racial stigma to slaves. It wasn't about ethnicity. It wasn't about race. For example, the Egyptian bondage of the children of Israel resulted from their number, not because of their skin color. Mm -hmm. Slavery in the Bible was very different from slavery in America. This mindset that Christian slaveholders and non-Christian slaveholders should justify slavery for three basic reasons. The Africans are a distinct race of people. They cannot mix with whites and must exist as a separate class. Mm -hmm. The Africans are a class of inferior to the whites in intellectual and moral development. They are incompetent to self-government. See, that's why y'all angel food cake, we devil cake. <laughs> the angel food cake is light, the devil food cake is dark. We cut, those stigmas came out of this. Those stereotypes that we even put on food comes out of this. I can name so many others that just blow your mind. The Israelites subdued heathen people. <coughs> it is appropriate to make the domestic slaves of the <coughs> people. This is how whites, Europeans in America, have perpetuated and supported this kind of mentality of blacks and darker skinned people being the inferior group. They're, they're not intellectually on our level. They're, they're morally more wretched than we are. Where that at in the Bible? I thought everybody was dead in sins and trespasses until they were made alive in Christ. Mm -hmm. These views provide a basis for debate over the justification for American slavery and the lack of justification for American slavery. One such debate is found in this quote. The debate within the Christian community over slavery led to splits within major denominations. I'm telling you, this has been a problem in the church and still is. Many of the splits left the more fundamental evangelical groups supporting race-based slavery, while many of the more liberal groups were abolitionists. Do you, do you see why blacks tend to go to the liberal groups? For example, the issue of slavery divided the Baptists into two groups in 1845. The Southern Baptists who were pro-slavery and the American Baptists who were abolitionists. Now, recently, the Southern Baptist has repented of their sins of this. But that's recently. So from 1845 up until recently, this was their mentality. And they're the, they're the largest denomination in the world. But they were founded on a pro-slavery platform. Hmm. There's a book I have in my library that was recently written, Removing the Stain of Racism from the Southern Baptist Convention. And it talks about all this. The history and how the Southern Baptist Convention was founded on slavery. While the more liberal groups were abolitionists. Hmm. The church in America will continue to have a difficult time helping to provide answers to a divided nation outside the church when it is not Molly solution to the same division discord inside the church among its own diverse ethnic group and among culturally diverse groups. The church must first focus on the common unity and diversity problem of humanity before salvation and the common unity and diversity solution among humanity found after salvation. The gospel is the only bridge available to cross over between unredeemed humanity to redeemed. Our time is gone. We'll pick up on this next week. Father, we just thank you so much. Bless your people. May we do further study to enlighten our minds to what the truth is, historically and presently, based on your word and not based on what the world has told us, not even in the church. 
For when the church departs from your word, it departs from you. <coughs> Help us, your dynamic life, to be a reflection of the biblical model of unity and diversity. To the glory of God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.